The Bible, a book whose origins lie thousands of years ago in the Middle East. It still inspires billions today. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Seven figures from different walks of life offer their personal perspective on the best-selling book of all time and what it means to them. Even if you've never read a word of the Bible, your life will have been shaped by it. In this program, Jerry Adams investigates the life of Jesus. My friends might describe me as a staunch Catholic because when I was in prison, I always went to Mass, and I was one of the minority who went to Mass. There's nothing nicer than church music or the communal dimension of being in the church, but a lot of it's far from the very simple message of a preacher on the side of a road or on the side of a hill talking to people. I mean, Jesus didn't have a church. For as long as I have a memory, Jesus has been in there as the baby Jesus right through to the crucifixion, to his execution. His ministry was just for one year, and that one year has affected, for 2,000 years, human beings everywhere. So I'm interested in getting into the real Jesus, the person, the human being, and then just, you know, reflecting on my own life, uh, on all the twists and turns of it, and of imprisonment, of lifelong activism. Did the teachings of Jesus impact upon that in a positive way, or did I ignore them? And just trying to examine uh, its relevancy to me. Each one of us knows that for which they are responsible. Right? And each one of us at some period in time is going to meet God. Right? Now, I, I am I'm, I'm happy enough right, as that my contribution that I, that I have tried to live by my standards. The absolute credo of my political being is on the right of the people of this island to be free and to have an end to partition and an end to British involvement in our affairs. In my teens and early 20s, I was radicalized by sectarian violence against Catholics, which drove many people I knew from their homes and pushed many ordinary young men and women to take up arms. In my 50s, along with others, I helped bring peace to Ireland. Looking back on three decades of war, I want to explore the Jesus message of forgiveness and how this has affected me and victims of the conflict. I will never, to my dying day, forgive anyone who was involved in Pat's murder. You don't win wars by, by just bombing people into oblivion. In face of the present campaigns of Republican violence, the choice of all Catholics is clear. It is a choice between good and evil. Do you feel you have blood on your hands? No, I don't. Uh, I, I feel that I've done my best by my own, by my own lights. But, you know, I, I don't, uh, um, I don't for, for one second step back from my responsibilities as a, a, a leader of a struggle uh, that has caused both hurt and uh, damage to other, other human, human beings. I don't, I don't walk away from that. My search for the historical Jesus will take me to Israel and Palestine. But first I'm going to talk to a leading Irish theologian, Professor Vincent Toomey. If I want to find out about Jesus, what are the, uh, the source is I should go to? Well, the source are the four Gospels, evidently. 
the Gospels, you know, weren't written by the apostles, but they actually faithfully record their teaching. And that is what is important, yeah. Did any of the Gospel writers actually know Jesus? Mark could have, we don't know. Right. Four Gospels, as we have, of course, uh, emerged out of different uh, communities and different situations. They arose in response to the dying out of the apostles. So the communities throughout the world founded by the apostles uh, had these oral memories of Jesus Christ. Yeah? These then were collected, written down. Given the complex origins of the Gospels, I wonder how faithful today's Bible is to what the evangelists wrote. The Chester Beatty Museum in Dublin houses some of the oldest gospel manuscripts in the world. What we are looking at is the earliest physical copy of St. Mark's Gospel. You cannot go back any further. The text actually relates to Jesus curing the blind man. And when this uh, manuscript was found, um, scholars were very excited and they went through it letter by letter, line by line, to make sure that the text that has come down to us in English translations that people would have in pocket books like these, that there's no great variation. And by and large, there isn't. By and large, we're looking at an exact copy. So we still have the story of the miracle here as you would have it in a more modern book. This is 250 AD or thereabouts. What this shows is that all the copies of the Bible after this date reflect the same yeah. text. And this authenticates yes. the Bible which mm -hmm. I read, which, mm -hmm. which people read today. Exactly. You really can't begin to understand a person's story or a nation's unless you see it in its proper context. So I've come to the Holy Land to see some of the places Jesus visited during his ministry. The year of his adult life between his baptism and his death on the cross. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre builds at the place where Jesus is said to have been crucified. There's a shrine where you can touch the very spot where the cross stood. A few steps away within the church, another richly decorated shrine, the tomb of Jesus. But with all the gilt and glitter, it's difficult to picture what a first century tomb might really have looked like. And the ancient burial ground outside the city walls. British archeologist, Shimon Gibson, has offered to show me a recently excavated tomb from the time of Jesus. It, it's going to be um, quite cramped inside, but okay. it'll be fun, I tell you. To go into a tomb from the first century. Well, Sinn Féin okay. used to be an underground movement. Ah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> the best thing is to go in feet first. Well, this is quite um, far down, isn't it? So here you can see this burial chamber uh, has two benches, so two people could be placed inside. And this is really the kind of bench on, on which uh, the body of Jesus would have been placed. And that's the, you see what you're leaning against is uh, the door of one yeah. of the, the locular. Yeah. Quite a hefty stone, isn't it? It is a hefty stone. Yeah. You know that the, um, the stone which blocked the tomb uh, of uh, Jesus, it's always uh, thought to be a rolling stone, a yeah. round stone. Yeah. It looks like the stone was probably rectangular, uh, which was very common uh, in that period. And in fact, you see, the dead person would have been slotted in. They would have um, slotted him in for head first. There may be many so, people who would wish that I was... Yes. <laughs> incarcerated. <laughs> well, I've been incarcerated. Yeah, but within a barrel recess. <laughs> so that's it. You'll see it's just the, the, the length of, a, is, of an adult is, man. This is exactly what a long case tunnel was like. 
I've got a sense of the end of Jesus' life. Now I want to go back and look at the historical context of this young Jewish man's astonishing journey from the cradle to the cross. The little town of Bethlehem, David's royal city of the Christmas corals, is a Palestinian town trapped inside a 25-foot separation wall, part of a 400-mile barrier designed to keep Palestinians out of Israel. The wall cuts off the people of Bethlehem from the land they own and the people they love. George, our driver, is a Palestinian with an Israeli passport. My wife, she's Palestinian, she's from Bethlehem, and because she's carrying Palestinian ID, she cannot live with me in Israel. That's why I left Nazareth and I live in Bethlehem. So the, so the separation wall, if you hadn't moved, would actually separate you from your wife? Yes, yes, and a lot of families were destroyed because of the separation wall. Travelling with me is Helen Bond from Edinburgh University, an expert on the historical Jesus. Two of the Gospels say Jesus was born here. The other two don't mention a birthplace at all. So was Jesus really born in Bethlehem? Historically, yeah. I don't think it's likely at all. Um, the difficulty is that these traditions are only found in Matthew and Luke's Gospel, nowhere else in the New Testament. I think what's happening here is that towards the late first century, Christians want to say now that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of David. And what better way to, to prove that than to have him born here in the city of David, in Bethlehem. Matthew, for example, wants Jesus to be a second Moses. And so his birth story is very much modeled on the, the birth of Moses. So in exactly the same way that the Egyptian pharaoh killed all the boys under two at the birth of Moses, so Herod the Great, the bad king, kills all the boys under two at the birth of Jesus. Which means that Joseph and Mary didn't come to Bethlehem, in fact, could also mean that Jesus wasn't born in a manger and he wasn't born in a stable. That's right, but you know, those traditions are only found in Luke. They're just not ruined, in Matthew. Just ruined Christmas. <laughs> I don't think it means ruining Christmas. I think for, for practicing Christians, there's a lot in those traditions. But if you're asking about the historical Jesus, I don't think he was born here. I think he was born in Nazareth. The Gospels are not history in the modern sense. For me, the important fact is not where Jesus was born. It's the fact that he was born and lived and died in the way he did. Whatever about our historical shortcomings, the Gospels are our only major source for the story of Jesus. But there is another book which tells us a great deal about the world he lived in. Just about everything we know of first century Judea comes from the works of Josephus. Mm -hmm. He's a first century Jewish aristocrat who's born in Judea just a slightly after the time of Jesus. But he's really important. Well, I see here just in his little bio, he was a Jew, he fought against Rome. Then he defected to Rome, so... <laughs> so how trustworthy is he? Basically, he's the only person we've got. I mean, if it wasn't for Josephus, we'd know virtually nothing. So, so we have to use him with caution, but I think he's a very good witness. Jesus gets barely a mention in Josephus. He has much more to say about a traveling preacher who, according to the Gospels, prepared the way for Jesus. I'm heading to the Jordan River and the place where John the Baptist is said to have baptized Jesus. The baptismal site is now in the middle of a huge minefield on the border between Israel and Jordan. We need a military escort to get us through. John was in a tradition 
of radical preachers who withdrew from society and took to the wilderness. Josephus tells us that he was a spellbinding orator and drew large crowds. I mean, his message is that God is about to intervene in human affairs and change things. There's going to be some great cataclysmic judgment and people are going to be sorted into those who are in and those who are out. Oh, it's horribly dirty. I'll tell you what, it's very cool on the feet after yeah. playing about all day. So, so the first mention of of, of Jesus in terms of a, a public ministry comes with his baptism. Yes, it's, it's striking. I think all the Gospels start the public ministry, at any rate, with John the Baptist and um, Jesus' baptism, which I think maybe suggests that there was something about that baptism for Jesus that, that really started him off on his independent mission. The dawning of the day in a green, fertile land by the shores of a freshwater lake. This is where Jesus was raised and where he returned after his baptism by John. Well, we're beside the Sea of Galilee. It's, it's very idyllic, I must say. Good way to start your day. This is where Jesus performed many miracles up along these these shores. This is where he calmed the waters. It's where he recruited the first of his apostles, poor fishermen, walking along here. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Is there one part of the gospel where this is, you know, crystallized? If you, if you were going to say to somebody, look, uh, there's, the, there's the core of it. Uh, is it the Sermon well, the, Mount, the Sermon uh, on the Mount, of course, comes to, to mind immediately, you know. Sermon on the Mount, as you know, is um, a compilation of sayings of, uh, attributed to our Lord. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We're talking about here about a radicalization of the moral law, which was expressed by the Ten Commandments. Yeah? You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You have heard that it has been said, I shall love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. You ask me what's the core of Jesus' message? I think it's forgiveness. Uh, that we ourselves recognize we need forgiveness. We're none of us perfect. Yeah? We've all made mistakes. Yeah? We have to forgive each other. Yeah? I think the message of repentance, the message of uh, forgiveness are, are deeply personal concepts. Uh, Bad things have been done to me. Uh, I have forgiven those who did it. I did it in the first instance for me. I didn't do it for them. I did it for me because I didn't want to become corroded. I've met some of the people who beat me senseless on one or two occasions and I helped negotiate a Good Friday Agreement that got the people who shot me out of prison. I don't forgive, and I haven't come to terms, and I still have a sense of outrage about the conditions that were created by those in powerful positions. 
who put one side against the other, who sectarianized it, who exploited the differences, who, who brought in all of their technology and, and so on, much like those who actually had uh, to take a conscious decision to construct the cross. Statistics say the IRA was responsible for more than 600 civilian deaths. Do you repent of your support for those who shot and bombed people during the conflict? Well, I don't attempt to justify the actions. In fact, I've been very critical of some of the actions. But I do believe that it was legitimate to resort to armed actions and that that was politically defensible. And, and I haven't changed my mind in that. I would love that there had been another way, but I, I, I don't live in that world. I live in the practical world, and I was part of that constituency which put together another way. According to the Gospels, large crowds flocked to the shores of Galilee to hear Jesus preach. Meanwhile, John the Baptist was about to pay a high price for his popularity. He'd been arrested on the orders of Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee and the puppet of the Romans. Yes, well, Josephus says quite clearly that Herod Antipas put him in chains and took him to the fortress of Machaerus because he was attracting large crowds. And he was executed. Jesus must have known that he was on the same path. I think you're right. And also, I mean, it seems to be just a fact that most of these holy men do end up being killed. Sometime after hearing about the execution of John the Baptist, Jesus left Galilee and headed south to the city at the heart of the Jewish world. He knew there would be no return. As we say in Irish, he said, Gar go kion scriba. The die was cast. Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Tradition has it that Jesus arrived in Jerusalem on a Sunday. Less than a week later, his life would be over, nailed to a cross and left to die in agony. What did he do that led to him being executed in this very, very brutal public uh, way, and who was it that murdered him? The last week of the life of Jesus played out during Passover, the feast celebrating the liberation of the Jews from enslavement in Egypt. The city was overrun with pilgrims heading for the great temple of Jerusalem. Daniel Swartz is a historian at the Hebrew Morning. University. Hello. This was the core of Judaism in Jesus' time. This was the house of God. This is the temple that Jesus came to? Yes, sir. This is, it's, uh, this is the Temple Mount. The temple wasn't yeah, there anymore. And, and, yes. yeah. What would the Passover have been like here, you know, with every family or every Jewish person coming to Make sacrifice. The Passover was typically the major pilgrimage festival of the year, and the population of Jerusalem might be two or three times larger, uh, the, its usual size. This would have been a market street in front of us before you get to the Temple Mount. It would be full of people who are buying food for their stay here, who are buying sacrifice, sacrificial animals to take with them to the temple, who are changing money because they came from wherever they came from and they need to use the local currency. In Jesus' day, the Jews were desperately hoping for a leader to free them from Roman occupation. The Roman soldiers would be there because when you get uh, thousands of Jews together on the holiday, which is in memory of the redemption of the Jews from enslavement to the Egyptians, it doesn't take very much imagination to turn it into a holiday which is um, um, giving room for hope and uh, for redemption from enslavement to the Romans. Into this tense and threatening situation came Jesus. Jesus entered the temple area 
and drove out all those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Jesus was defying the chief priests, an elite group who collaborated with the Romans to rule Judea. But the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. With Roman soldiers on riot duty, a preacher stirring up the Passover crowds could trigger a bloodbath. The chief priests and their leader, Caiaphas, decided to act. We actually have quite an interesting little detail about Caiaphas in John's Gospel. He gives an account of a gathering of the, the Jewish council, and they say, if we allow Jesus to carry on like this, the Romans are going to come and they'll, they'll destroy our temple and our nation. And Caiaphas apparently stands up and says, um, it's, you don't realize that it's, it's better that one man die for the people than that the whole nation should perish. The problem with that, Helen, is Elites never present their case as anything other than being for the common good, for the public interest. But could he not genuinely have wanted to, to safeguard Jewish life? I mean, you only need to look at what happens 30, 40 years later in the Jewish revolt. When, when people do revolt against Rome and Rome sends in the legions sweeping through the country and tens of thousands of people end up dying. The fact is, Jesus was taking on the establishment. The outcome was clear, and he knew it. Shimon Gibson, the archaeologist, has been looking for the place where Jesus was tried by the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Uh, this is where I think the trial of Jesus took place. Jesus have, would have, uh, have walked, walked these down steps. these steps. Yeah. John talks about the trial taking place at Gabata, which means a little hillock or a rocky area. Well, here you have that rocky area. So we're here at the spot. And of course, this was blocked up later. Pontius Pilate was the most powerful man in the land. He would decide whether Jesus would live or die. Behold, nothing deserving of death has been done by this man. The Gospels, of course, suggest that he's a weakling, easily pushed over by the people he's supposed to be governing. The pilot that you get in Josephus, you can't really imagine him being so uncertain, so, so lacking in any kind of judgment. But there's an even better source on um, pilot from Philo of Alexandria. He's actually a contemporary, an exact contemporary of um, Jesus. Um, a Jew living in Alexandria in Egypt. And um, he has a passage which actually describes Pilate's character, his venality, his violence, his thefts, his assaults, his abusive behavior, his frequent executions of untried prisoners, and his endless savage ferocity. But the Pilate of the Gospels is anything but ferocious. You have a custom that I should release for you one man at the Passover. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Give us Barabbas! Give us Barabbas. What does the historical record say about the practice described in the Gospels of releasing a prisoner at the Feast of Passover? People actually have asked, was there indeed such a practice? Is there any evidence for such a practice? And um, the answer is no, this is the only case. I don't think he would have been released because in those days, insurgents, those who were defying the authorities, both the Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities especially, would not have uh, uh, been released. Uh, this and would and Barabbas was a, an insurrectionist. He wasn't a thief. He wasn't a common thief. He was a... Well, he would be what we would uh, describe today as a terrorist um, mm. in modern terms. Um, and for the, from the Roman authorities, um, terrorists were, were to be stamped out. Mm. Um, but from, from someone else's viewpoint, he may well have been a freedom fighter. Yes, from somebody else's uh, point of view. I am innocent of this man's blood. All the people answered that his blood be on us and on our children. So why do the gospel writers whitewash Pilate and free him the entire Jewish people instead. They have this huge problem on their hands that they're wanting to say that Jesus, the Messiah, was somebody who ended up on a Roman cross. 
The Gospel writers are trying to convert as many Romans as possible, while also trying to avoid being thrown to the lions. I'm standing on some soapbox in Rome in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s of the first century, preaching about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a wonderful guy. He was the son of God. And people say, oh, wonderful, where is he? And then we say, he's dead. Oh, was he sick? No, he was executed. Oh, who executed him? The Roman governor. So the next sentence on the part of the preacher is going to have to be, yes, but it was a mistake. The only reason Pilate executed him is because he was sort of spineless and being pushed around by an Eastern mob. And scenes like this Baraba scene, just like scenes I'm going to wash my hands, functioned that way to allow for a group which anyways is suspect in the Roman Empire and somehow to try and survive by pushing off the guilt to other parties. As we say in Irish, and Chainak will lighter the falur adave glick. If you're not strong, you have to be clever. So the blame goes on to the Jewish people. And the irony of that situation is that that's totally and absolutely contrary to the type of tolerance, love thy neighbor, inclusivity, that Jesus preached right through, the, the, right through all of his uh, public uh, ministry. From the sixth hour on to the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up the spirit. Some may quibble about the historical accuracy of the Gospels. That's not the issue for me. The Gospels were about promoting a new religion, Christianity. But Jesus' core teachings, the words he spoke, remain as powerful today as they were 2,000 years ago. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Tough words to live up to. Whether you're an Irish political activist or a Palestinian follower of Jesus, like Salim Manayer, who teaches at the Bible College in Bethlehem, hemmed in by Israeli settlements. We deal as Palestinian Christians with, uh, with, with, with another spiritual dimension that the people that they're coming and settling there and the people that confiscating Palestinian land are the people that brought us our spiritual heritage. Mm. Jesus yeah, yeah, is yeah. a Jew. He was a Jew, absolutely. Yeah. What would Jesus say today? Jesus will speak the word of the prophets. Jesus would say, in, remember you were a stranger in Egypt. You were powerless and now you have power. We are powerful. You are misusing your power against the weak. And what would he say to people in the Palestinian side who would resort to armed actions or to... Yeah. Uh, holding arm against the Israeli, like holding arms against the Roman, you don't have a chance. They will crush you. They're more mm. powerful than you. Is that a, a, and, tactical, and, a tactical question? No, it's, it's also more analytical questions. Right. Because if you resist evil, you will have the tit and tat, the cycle of revenge and retaliation. Salim runs an organization which promotes dialogue between Palestinians and Israelis. Its name in Arabic means forgiveness. not a pacifist. I don't believe that non-violent resistance was an option for us 40 years ago. The war is over, but we're all still on a journey to freedom. And after decades of violent conflict, all of us have plenty to forgive and to be forgiven for.
To those people who are watching this who say, well, Jerry Adams, you defend the IRA, in what way did you follow Jesus when defending the IRA? Well, by my own lights, but uh, let's not get carried away again with any of this. I'm a political activist. My religious beliefs are private and personal to me. Obviously, my core values, which are shaped by my religious beliefs, uh, have to percolate and influence my political thinking. Sometimes in tune with the Jesus message, sometimes not. But if you have this moral code based on the teachings of Jesus, surely you can't pick and choose which bits of it you observe when. I mean, Well, you can. You mightn't be right to do it, but we all do it. You know, we all do it in, in different aspects of our lives because we're human and, and because, you know, we're not perfect and because we do our best in the situations. The fact is, when people are treated badly, as people were treated here, and remember, you know, an English government has no entitlement whatsoever to partition Ireland or to be involved in Irish affairs. If there's no one out there pushing for a peaceful, democratic way to resolve those injustices, then as night follows day, you will get resort to armed actions. Belfast Shankill Road was devastated just after one o'clock this afternoon. The IRA used the simplest of tactics, hand delivering a bomb across the counter at a fish and chip shop. Among the dead, the chip shop owner and his daughter. My wife was murdered um, by the IRA on the 23rd of October 1993. Uh, it was a Saturday and she was killed along with her father and eight other people, including one of the, one of the bombers, was killed as well. That Saturday morning, two young IRA volunteers, Thomas Bagley and Sean Kelly, carried a bomb into a face shop on the Shankill Road, a union area of my constituency in Belfast. Their target was a meeting of unionist paramilitary leaders in an office on the first floor. The bomb went off prematurely. Sean Kelly survived. Thomas Bagley was killed. It was a stupid operation. You know, it didn't, it didn't take into account uh, the safety of the, of the civilians and of course Thomas gets the blame for this and clearly the blame is one which has to be shared and it's just it was, a, it was an operation which was just fundamentally flawed and fundamentally wrong. Jerry Adams carried the coffin of Thomas Begley and I think at that time I felt that particularly tough. So for many many years I uh, would have blamed uh, Jerry Adams, not, as I said, for the bomb, but certainly for being part of an organisation which felt that they could go out and, uh, and do that, you know. It's a measure of how far we've all come in the last 16 years that Alan McBride now feels able to sit down with me and talk. Three and a half thousand people murdered and 40,000 people injured and all those young people that were incarcerated, you know. I don't think it was worth one of their lives, I'll be honest with you, Jerry. You don't win wars by, by just bombing people into oblivion. Jerry Adams himself later said his sympathy was with all victims. Under the government ban, we can't broadcast his voice. Are we going, are we going to blame a young man of 23 year old from a, from a poor working class background in Belfast for the conflict in this country? My sympathy is with everyone who was killed. Not everybody was innocent and not everybody was guilty. You know, we weren't all on the same page. To suggest that my wife and, and Thomas Begley or Sean Kelly were on the same page in terms of their guilt or their innocence or their victimhood is, is, is a nonsense, absolute nonsense to me. Uh, obviously, Thomas Bagley has to be responsible for his mm -hmm. action and all of us have to be responsible individually for our actions, but this was a corporate mm -hmm. IRA responsibility. It wasn't just these two relatively young yeah. volunteers who had been sent out, obviously, to do uh, what they did. His family, you know, it wasn't... It was, mm -hmm. The family didn't do it. This is where people make the mistake. I don't think we should be looking at it in terms of what happened. We should be looking at it in terms of what, what's left behind and what the needs are. And I know from my perspective that, uh, that Mrs Begley lost her son uh, uh, that day on the Shankill Road. Um, not only did she lose her son, but she has to live the rest of her days with the knowledge that her son killed nine other people. And I think that must be, if it was me, that would be unbearable to even think about that. Um, so society needs to give Mrs Begley whatever help that we can give her to help her come to terms with her own hurt and her pain. Sean Kelly, 
was released with other political prisoners under the Good Friday Agreement. I don't know that I've ever said that I've forgiven um, Sean Kelly for, for what happened. Uh, he's somebody that I don't really care much about, to be honest with you. And also as well, the people I do care about, you know, my family, my mother-in-law. Um, I mean, I, they would never forgive me, you know, if I forgive him. I'm not hell-bent on revenge. Um, I don't think I have one bone in my body which is about taking revenge. Um, I think we need to be more like Jesus and maybe not so religious. Mm. <laughs> that sounds like a contradiction in terms, you know. I think the religious aspect sometimes can, uh, can keep us apart. Those who can find it within themselves to do what, what, what you're doing, uh, I think are probably more true to what is the Jesus message than, than others, including myself. I know that where we are today is a hell of a lot better than where we were 16 years ago when I started this particular journey. And, um, and I think you've played your part in that, so... Well, thanks for, thanks for, to you, okay. for the example you're giving people like me. Okay, thank you. Okay. Five years before Alan lost his wife to an IRA bomb, my good friend and solicitor Pat Finucane was murdered by a UDI death squad. I carried his coffin also. Pat was at home with his three young children and his wife Geraldine. We were having dinner, Sunday dinner, just Pat and myself and the three children. And there was a bang. And Pat and I jumped up and the next thing, there was just gunfire everywhere. Um, and Pat was dead on the kitchen floor. Geraldine, who was also wounded in the attack, is certain that the British authorities colluded in her husband's murder. I will never, to my dying day, forgive anyone who was involved in Pat's murder. From the gunmen right to the people, perhaps at cabinet level, who orchestrated this, I will never forgive them. They changed my life forever. But that doesn't mean to say that I want revenge. I don't want to harm them. But I do want to make them accountable for what they did, for their actions. Their actions have given me a life that I didn't want. Do you have any sort of affinity with Jesus, with the gospel stories, with any of that? Um, I would follow Christian principles, but I couldn't go so far as to say I'm a Christian. And one of the big challenges in, in those teachings is the little one which says, love thy enemy. You know, I mean, it's, it's easy to love your friends, but... What's your take on that? I might not be able to love my enemy, but I can learn to live with them. Faced with the grim truths of war, loving your enemy is a lot to ask. Alan and Jardine may never forgive the men who murdered their partners, but they don't want revenge. I remember a poem of W.B. Yeats in the line in it, too long a sacrifice makes the stone of the heart. You know, war is so corrosive. I mean, I've said many times that while there are very brave people in, in war, we should not glamorize it. You know, it's a horrible business. You have to harden yourself because it isn't a natural thing to go out and do harm to other, other human beings. Uh, it isn't a natural thing to engage in planned violence. There were times when I was afraid my heart would break. I mean, and I can be as angry and as ruthless and as focused and as delivered in terms of what I have to do as, as anyone else. But I have a fairly logical mind. So even though I could be angry at something that was done out of the stupid, through, through the stupidity of the side that I supported or, or by those who were uh, opposing us, I, I never felt entirely brutalized by, by what was going on. My service to my country, to the peace process, is in the ability of people like me to bring other people with us. 
and that's the core of it, that, that there was at least an Irish Republican leadership which was prepared when they got an alternative, that they went for peace. They could have went for continued war, but they went for uh, peace. And this was put very well to me by an, an associate. I was trying to help with some other peace processes in other parts of the world. And someone said to me, it needs generals to make peace. Okay. Do you feel generally that you would be more at peace if people forgave you for what I'm, things? I'm, I am perfectly at peace, Dan. <laughs> Absolutely. I uh, believe and I've made mistakes and done things wrong and not for a second to I stand over everything that, that I ever did or said you know, because you know, everything is always right at the time. I regret very much that anyone, anyone, was ever hurt in the situation. I don't believe that I'm accountable for all of that, uh, but I do understand my responsibilities. But the one thing that I have, have always liked about Jesus is his lack of condemnation, his lack of denunciation, the way he mixes with all the wrong people, uh, the way, even though he sets out rules for life, he knows that we're imperfect and we're not going to fulfill it, so he gives us another chance and another chance and another chance. You know, you can go into a cathedral and to a a church, which is a nice thing to do and, and pray and reflect, but you know, here's a big cathedral here, and uh, I certainly feel closer to God here than perhaps in many other places. If you see something of great beauty, you know, the light in the sky, and uh, just, just a particular moment where it cheers you up, or where you're, you're struck by the beauty of it, and there's no explanation for it. Just, you just catch a wonderful moment in nature. And if you see over that, that's as much as a prayer as it is to kneel down and to go through a long litany of the, uh, the trimmings on the rosary. <laughs>